Make sure y'all hit the comments, that like button, subscribe. Let's go. Even if you studied history in school, there is a great chance that you didn't learn about these intriguing historical events. So stay tuned as we discuss 20 historical facts that you didn't know. Number 20, wars that incredibly started over food. If you heard about a war starting, food might be the last thing you'd think about as the possible cause. But it's happened in the past. A lot of wars started over food. One of them is the ridiculous pastry war of 1838 to 1839. The war started as a minor conflict between Mexico and France. A French pastry chef, Monsieur Remontel, who had set up a pastry shop in Veracruz, Mexico, requested that the Mexican government compensate him for the damage caused to his place of business by their soldiers in 1828. Here's how it really happened. Following a contested election between presidential candidates Manuel Gomez Pedraza and Vicente Guerrero Saldana in 1828, their loyalists fought on the street, causing losses of lives and property. Unfortunately, Monsieur Remontel's was one of the properties destroyed. However, the Mexican government refused to compensate the affected French citizens. France would later leverage the claims of its citizens as an excuse to send a fleet to Mexico in early 1838 to blockade the main port of Veracruz. In return, Mexico declared war on France, and French troops attacked and captured the city. Upon the intervention of British diplomatic channels, Mexico agreed to pay the 600,000 pesos demanded by France. The French then withdrew its troop from Veracruz, and their fleet returned to France in 1839. Number 19, the Olympics used to award medals for exquisite arts. Between 1912 and 1948, the Olympic Games held competitions in the arts industry. Just like winners of athletic competitions are awarded gold, silver, and bronze medals, winners are also awarded medals for literature, architecture, sculpture, painting, and music. At the 1912 Summer Olympics in Stockholm, American Walter Winans won two Olympic medals, a gold in 1908 for a small piece of bronze he had cast earlier that year and a silver for the same event in 1912. The artwork was a 20-inch tall horse pulling a small chariot. It wasn't until the eve of the 100th anniversary of the first artistic competition that Olympics fanatics were unaware that art... Wait a minute. Now, could y'all imagine... <laughs> could y'all imagine riding on the back of a horse, like, literally, in his behind, like... Yo. <laughs> On week right now because y'all know horses use the bathroom. They go number two. Like any given moment, any given time, and it's a lot and it's constant. I mean it's it's a sport, but come on y'all. Come on. I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I could not do it. They they had to put a whole bunch of something on, on in front of me, man. Like a whole. I don't know. Cause that's bad. Just just imagine it. It's constitute a part of modern games nearly from the onset. Pierre de Freddy, the founder of the modern Olympics, stated that the inclusion of arts was necessary because art festivals have always been an integral part of the ancient Olympic games. By the time the art events were removed, 151 medals had been awarded. The competitions were dropped from the Olympic Games following the difficulty of determining the amateur status of the artists. Number 18. Napoleon was once attacked by bunnies. It is hard to imagine how the mighty Napoleon, who was feared by many, was attacked by a horde of rabbits. Napoleon had planned to celebrate the signing of a peace treaty with Russia in 1807, by arranging a fashionable outdoor luncheon and rabbit hunt. For the rabbit hunt, there were about 1,000 rabbits. As the trumpets sounded the signal to release the bunnies, the creatures charged straight toward Napoleon and bombarded him and his mighty men. The bunnies sw Wait, wait, what? Wait. Wait a minute. Let's 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 keep going. Warmed under Napoleon's legs and climbed up onto his jacket. 
They nibbled at his buttons and gnawed at his boots. This prevented him from positioning his weapon to shoot the animals. To save him, his military tried so hard to drive the bunnies off with whips and sticks. Fortunately, they succeeded in helping Napoleon retreat to his carriage as the bunnies pursued still. But why, why did these rabbits attack Napoleon? Yeah. Napoleon's chief of staff, Baron Berthier, collected tamed bunnies from farmers rather than from the rabbit warrens of the wild. Oh. These farm rabbits hadn't been fed for the day, and Napoleon appeared to them as a meal. Oh. So it's normal that they charge at him. Oh. That was smart, yo. He got him. He got him. <laughs> How do but how do you think about using rabbits? Uh, well, why do the town have a thousand tame rabbits? What are their purpose? What was the purpose of that? Was it for that? Was it just for that? Hmm, they got some tricks up their sleeves, man. The old school. The old school really had some tricks up their sleeve. And it didn't even kill him. It just gnawed at his buttons and his boots. And, like, they were scaring him. You see what I'm saying? Like, was he a bunny whisperer or something? I don't know. Number 17. The government once poisoned alcohol during Prohibition. Alcohol was becoming extremely abused in the U.S. that the government had to bar its production, sale, and consumption. In 1926, the U.S. government attempted to enforce the so-called Noble Experiment and would mandate the inclusion of poisons, such as methanol, in industrial alcohol. The aim was to discourage people from drinking it. But isn't this illegal? The government didn't poison alcohol directly. Rather, it made sure toxic chemicals were added to industrial alcohols. First, it mandated companies to denature industrial alcohol, so it became unhealthy to drink. It subsequently ordered them to add quinine, methyl alcohol, and other toxic chemicals as a further deterrent. Despite the ban, the demand for alcohol remained strong. In other words, high demand for alcohol meant that sales of now toxic liquors continued despite the additive poisons. On January 1st, 1927, 41 deaths were recorded at New York's mm -hmm. Bellevue Hospital from alcohol-related poisonings. Mm -hmm. By the time the Prohibition law was repealed in 1933, the federal poisoning program was believed to have killed at least 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. Incredible, huh? <clears throat> Number six. But who took accountability for all of that? Who, who, who made that alcohol? That's what I want to know. Who made that alcohol? Nobody want to take accountability for over 10,000 deaths. All right. Whew. Moving right along then. Uh, yeah. 16. There were more than 600 plots to kill Fidel Castro. Former Cuban leader. How long? They... Did we just hear that right? 600 plots to kill Fidel Castro. This dude had to be a super gangster. I mean, super duper gangster. You heard me? Had to be. Leader Fidel Castro could be regarded as a legendary survivor. He was said to have survived more than 600 attempts to kill him. Yes, 600 attempts on his life. Although the figure is contestable, there are several reports of attempts to kill him in a variety of ways, including poisoning him, dosing his dive suit with a fungus that can cause chronic skin disease, and blowing his podium up during a speech. All of the... Man, listen, listen. If it's not your time to go, it's, it's just not your time to go. And for to be, for to be all those many death attempts, why you just don't sit down somewhere? Sit your butt down somewhere. You heard me. Sit down. I, you would not catch me. 
out like that, if if like you you just way out. I wouldn't keep being out there over six hundred plots. Man, you got to be you got to want to die. The assassination plots failed. The 2006 British documentary 638 Ways to Kill Castro states how Castro survived assassination attempts more than any socialist alive. Castro himself once chided his would-be assassins, saying, if surviving assassination attempts were an Olympic event, I would win the gold medal. And he would. And he would. It's like, man, he was a super gangster. Soup the the most super gangster that there is. It's crazy. Castro was able to survive so many assassination attempts despite living much of his life in the spotlight. He died at the old age of 90 on November 25th, 2016. Number 15. Pope Gregory IV declared a war on cats. While many people see cats as mere pets, Pope Gregory IV considered them evil. Pope Gregory IX, the 178th Pope of the Catholic Church from 1227 to 1241, declared war on the cat population. But why did he do this? Conrad of Marburg, the papal inquisitor at the time of Pope Gregory IX, had strong beliefs about cats. So he decided to make people confess to him, under torture, about how cats made people forsake God. He then concluded that cats were associated with the devil and should therefore be punished. Pope Gregory IV then issued a papal bull that declared cats as bearing Satan's spirit. As a result, a large number of cats were killed throughout Europe. It wasn't until he finally excommunicated cats that the killings stopped. The superstition that cats carry Satan's spirit around still lives on today, by the way. Number 14. It be those black cats, man. It be those black cats. <laughs> when I see one, my heart drops, especially when like I'm riding in a car and then like it wants to pass by, and I'm like, man, please don't pass by, please do not pass by. But they end up passing by anyways. Man. Mary actually had a little lamb. Remember the nursery rhyme, "Mary had a little lamb," published in 1830. The rhyme was based on an actual incident involving Mary Elizabeth Sawyer. In 1815, Mary, then nine, was helping her father on the farm when they discovered an abandoned sickly newborn lamb in the sheep pen. Mary pleaded to keep the lamb and succeeded in nursing it back to health. Mm -hmm. The lamb would then follow her to wherever she went. Mm -hmm. On a fateful day when Mary and his brother were heading to school, the lamb began following them. Mm -hmm. Rather than make sure it stayed back, they pacified it and had to take it over a large stone fence to get to the one-room schoolhouse they attended. On getting to school, Mary hid the lamb in her desk and covered her with a blanket. Mary was beckoned to the front of the class to recite her lessons when the lamb came out of its hiding place. Mary was left astonished, but her classmates saw the event as fun. She took the lamb out and took her home during lunch. The next day, one of Mary's classmates, John Rulestone, handed over a note to her. The note contains the nursery rhyme we now have today. Mm -hmm. We are sure you didn't know this story, or did you? Let us know in the comments. Did y'all really believe that song? I mean, I mean, it's self-explanatory. We all known about that. We all known about it. That's nothing. That's, that's nothing new. I thought they was going to tell us that the the boy done kidnapped the lamb overnight or uh, something and something more lifelike you know what i'm saying and left her a note like that you know but that wasn't the case so. okay number 13 ketchup was once used as medicine previously ketchup was a concoction of fish or mushrooms but in 1834 dr john cook bennett added to wait did y'all know we could bait Ketchup out of fish on mushrooms. <laughs> no, I didn't know. I didn't know. Tomatoes to ketchup. Since tomatoes are known to contain a plethora of vitamins and antioxidants, Dr. John claimed the sauce could cure diarrhea, indigestion, jaundice, and rheumatism. He then requested that salesman, Archibald Miles, 
make his sauce into an extract of tomato pills. Once the pills hit the market, there were different versions of tomato-based pills. Most of the supposed pills were merely laxatives with no trace of tomatoes. Since people didn't get the cure being portrayed, the ketchup medicine empire collapsed in 1850. However, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> the man put laxatives in his pills instead of tomatoes. So you just telling me that every time he feels sick, he pop with it and he goes straight to the bathroom. That's wild. Man, I would have had to do something to him, man. I would have had to do something to him. I'm sorry, but I would have had to do something to him. Really. All right, we, me and the towns, me and the towns folk has spoke. We got to do something to you, Creek. We got to get you. The collapse of the empire didn't suggest that the sauce ceased to exist. Henry Hines, an American entrepreneur, would later come up with today's version of tomato ketchup in 1876. The new version was created with ripe tomatoes, distilled vinegar, brown sugar, salt, Yo. and a variety of spices. Yo. Number 12, July 4th, isn't the real America's Independence Day. Although Americans have long regarded July 4th as Independence Day, technically, that is not the actual day the colonies voted to become a new nation. Did you just raise an eyebrow? We know you did. You did. The Second Continental Congress actually approved the resolution that declared independence from Britain on July 2nd, 1776. Therefore, Americans are supposed to celebrate their independence on July 2nd. But what changed? The change in date was more of a technical delay than an intentional act. Mm. After the resolution, it took two days for the final version of the press release indicating the independence to get to the printer. In other words, the document better known as the Declaration of Independence meant to accompany the resolution, bore the date July 4th, 1776, when it arrived at the printer. Also, when the then future president John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, one of the committee members, both died on July 4th, 1826, the date became more enshrined in American memory as the- Wait, what? <laughs> <coughs> Conspiracy theory, huh? Yeah, okay. All right, all right. Y'all sit down and believe all that you want to. Sit down and believe all that. The perfect Independence Day. Number 11, Thomas Edison didn't invent the electric light bulb. No. I can believe that too. I really can believe that. It's, it's, I'm, this, see, this my, first video so i'm not gonna get into that i'm gonna let that stay right where it is and let him explain it to y'all his way no it was not thomas edison that conceived the idea of inventing the light bulb but he could be credited for perfecting the device electric light bulbs had been around even before edison was born in the early all right see see do y'all see he was the inventor of perfecting it and making probably like making them last a little bit longer and whatever the case may be. But I mean, all right, listen, just pay attention. We learn early 19th century. There was the carbon arc light, which was made by the British chemist Humphrey Davy in 1807. This source of light was the vapor of battery heated carbon rods. However, the bulbs had to be hand lit which made them burn out easily. Subsequent designs were too expensive and could not be widely used. There were other designs by Warren de la Rue, but their platinum filament was too expensive. William State, State, whose batteries were too expensive, and Joseph Swan, whose light was too inefficient. Edison would then later purchase some of his predecessor's patents and invent the light bulb in 1879. Even though it only worked for short periods of time, why then, did Edison get all the credit? In 1880, Edison got his hands on the right material for his light bulb's filament. He used carbonized bamboo fiber, which burned longer than previous materials. So bamboo can be used. But I mean, hey, the the potato, the potato works. 
the potato really works. It does, man. Number 10, Henry Ford didn't invent the first car. There are some innovations we attribute to America, probably because it is known as the land of opportunities. Some of us actually believe that the first car was invented in the United States, but this is not true. The early automobile has German origins. The first vehicle was built in the 19th century by European engineers Carl Benz and Emil Levasseur, who were both working on automobile ideas. In 1886, Benz, as in Mercedes. Right. Mercedes Benz. But at the same time, man, I, I'm not even too sure about that. I'm thinking that, you know, maybe some slaves or something like that. Probably, um, you know, made that. They probably made it. Good chance. Sadie's Benz patented the first vehicle, a gas-fueled motor wagon or motor car. Benz's motor wagon was the first true modern automobile. After the invention, Benz would patent his own throttle system, spark plugs, gear shifters, a water radiator, a carburetor, and other fundamentals of the automobile. See? He eventually built a car company that is known today as the Daimler Group. Suppose you would consider... I'm telling you, this man did not just do this by himself. He had help by people that couldn't be shown. All right? He had the money, so he had the patent. You know, so it was his idea, so to speak, quote unquote. Telling y'all, man, he didn't come up with this. Somebody, somebody behind the scenes of another, of another, you know, I'm telling y'all now. I'm telling y'all. That are cars. Wait, no disrespect, no racism, no nothing. It's just history. It's just history of what, you know, have been portrayed is not as what it seems. Just like you thought Henry Ford was the first one. Nah. See, things aren't what they seem. All right. Just saying, open your mind a little. It's as self-propelled vehicles. In that case, we might also need to credit Leonardo da Vinci and Nicholas Joseph Cugno, who previously invented a horseless mechanized cart and self-propelled vehicle with a steam engine, respectively. Number nine, George Washington never had wooden teeth. There was a mistaken belief that George Washington <laughs> wore wooden teeth. In fact, the myth dominated the 19th century era, and historians went as far as including it in textbooks and even taught them in schools. It wasn't until the 20th century that we got to know the truth about George Washington's teeth. No doubt Washington had some dental issues and had to use multiple sets of dentures made from a variety of materials, including ivory, gold, lead, and human teeth. However, wood was never used in his dentures. Neither was it commonly employed by his dentists at that time. Although the origin of the myth is unknown, dental scientists and historians have conceived a possible explanation. The explanation was that the ivory employed in the dentures that were fabricated for Washington by dentist John Greenwood easily got stained, that they wore a grained wooden look. Observers would be misled by the appearance and concluded that Washington wore wooden dentures. Actually, Washington's dentures gave him some discomfort. At the same time, the myth that he wore teeth made out of ordinary wood actually changed the perception. I mean, look at the metal. Look at the metal that they had to wear in their mouth, like thick metal. Thick metal that they had to wear in their mouth, man. That had to be uncomfortable as heck. You had to be a soldier, man. That mouth is... Woo! Exception of the populace that Washington, after all, was also a common person. Number seven, Columbus didn't actually discover America. At one time, we've been made to believe that Christopher Columbus discovered America. It was for this reason that most American textbooks started in 1776 when telling the story of the nation. Columbus never discovered America. 
In fact, humans have lived in the nation for at least 15,000 years. Columbus only arrived after the Americas were populated by hundreds of small nations and several empires, including the Inca in Peru and the Aztecs in Mexico. Now, who was the first to create a settlement in the Americas? It was the Viking explorer Eric the Red who lived from 950 to 1003 CE. He established a colony in Greenland during the 10th century, about 982, while his son Leif Erikson established one in Newfoundland in about 1000. The Greenland settlement lasted 300 years, while the one in Newfoundland failed just after a decade. What did Columbus actually do to earn the title of the man who discovered America? He was credited with being the first European to conquer a small part of the Americas successfully and then establish a trade route for the transportation of goods and slaves. In other words, Christopher Columbus didn't discover America but monetized it. Next time someone tells you Columbus discovered America, just know that they had no proper understanding of the history of America. Number so he was just sent to make sure it, like what became of it since uh, what? Nine, the year 800, 900? Come on, man. Come on, man. That's like going, okay, so what? He came a thousand years later? That's basically what it is. That's, if the numbers don't lie, was it supposed to be 1872 or something like that? I don't know. Don't, don't get me the line, but it, well, whenever he did, it, it just, it, man, look. I ain't even trying to hear that. And it's like the year 2023, so. Number six, elephants used to carry out executions. Elephants are smart and powerful animals. No doubt they were used to carry out brutal executions for more than 2,000 years. Execution by elephants was prevalent in India and some parts of South and Southeast Asia. The act, known, known as, as Gunga Rao, Rao, involves the crushing of an accused to death with brute force. Yeah, I've heard of that. They, they, it's in movies too. Like, um, if you, if you, if you watch movies, India and all of that good stuff, they already show you that. So, you know, some, and then in history, like back then, see, I went to a school that they actually taught about a little bit of slavery and, you know, uh, stuff like this right here. Like that's, I went in my, in my social studies, my history class and in social studies, we, we knew about this. Then, elephants were under the control of a mahout, known as an elephant trainer. He would force the animal with the use of a sharp metal hook, such that it carries out his commands. <clears throat> and what was the command all about? It involved inflicting a slow and torturous death by crushing the limbs of a convicted person one by one and tossing them around, dragging them, or stabbing them with the elephant's tusks, before finally crushing their skull. What a horrible way to die. This form of execution by elephant was also practiced in neighboring Sri Lanka and the former kingdom of Siam. It continued into the 19th century. It was the increasing presence of the British in India that eventually made the practice decline. Number eight, U.S. Presidents John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died on the same day. On July 4, 1826, former Presidents John Adams and Thomas Jefferson who were once fellow patriots and later adversaries, died within five hours of each other. Adams served as president between 1797 and 1800 and was considered a staunch supporter of a strong centralized government. Jefferson, on the other hand, served two presidential terms from 1801 to 1809 and believed that the center should be decentralized to allow for individual states' rights. Although the duo had different ideals, they both united in their belief in democracy and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Both Adams and Jefferson engaged in a bitter campaign during the 1800 presidential election. It was 14 years later that they renewed their friendship. At that time, Jefferson admitted that he and Adams were both fellow laborers in the same cause. On July 4, 1826, Adams died at the ripe age of 90. His last words were, Thomas Jefferson still survives. Unfortunately, he was unaware that Jefferson had died five hours earlier at the age of 83. Number five, 
Turkeys were once Man. worshipped. Wait, 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 wait. So they were poisoned, basically. Down on the same day, five hours apart. It just took one longer to hit the system than the other one. Or one ate this specific thing or drunk this specific thing before he did. They had the same dinner or something. Or what? I mean, I don't know. And then what would make him, what would make that his last words? Thomas Jefferson still survives, not knowing he was already dead. Rest in peace to him, man. I don't understand, but all the conspiracy and nobody got charged for that. I don't even know if they had autopsy back then, but yeah. But let's let's get back to this. This is we learning something, y'all. We learning. Does gods by Mayans? If there's anything you know about turkeys, it is that they are good <laughs> sources of meat, right? Well. The Mayans think otherwise. In 300 BC, turkeys were considered by the Maya as vessels of the gods. They would domesticate them to play a part in religious rites. This is because these birds are perceived to symbolize power and prestige. At that time, turkeys were owned almost exclusively by the rich and powerful. The power of the turkey was expressed in religious rituals where Mayans slit their throats to set the stage for a fertile new year. This was based on the belief that these beautiful birds served as messengers of the gods. Although it was almost impossible for the Maya to tame the local wild turkeys, they used both northern and local oscillated turkey. Number four, yoga has been practiced. Ah, uh, well, I got, I was trying to tell people about the sacrifices with animals and, um, uh, Especially since I moved here. Um, it's like a lot of people don't believe in that type of stuff or they act like uh nah, 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 nah. Um, but where I'm from, which is North Carolina, you know, they we learn about these things in history class. So yeah. There you have it. Just up north I guess they teach about the teachings of down south. And down south, they try to teach about the teachings up north because it's where we're not. It's like we don't want to try to make our own places look bad. But I don't know. Just for more than 5,000 years. If you think yoga is a recent practice because of its suitability to the modern era, you're wrong. It will surprise you to know that the practice has been around for over 5,000 years. In fact, some researchers claim that yoga may have been around for up to 10,000 years. Either way, India has embraced yoga as an integral part of its way of life since ancient times. It also used to be part of daily rituals to God among many communities. However, in the present age, people now see yoga as a new form of fitness activity that makes their body as well as mind fit and healthy. The major components of yoga include breathing and postures which include a series of movements that are aimed at increasing strength and flexibility. The most interesting aspect of this practice is that it has been adopted and adapted in many countries in a variety of unique ways. Number three, Egyptians used slabs of stone as pillows. When you go to bed, it's likely you'd use a soft pillow to avoid any form of ache in your neck. But did you know that ancient Egyptians slept on pillows made of stone? Incredible, right? That's the truth. The ancient stone pillow was commonly called the headrest and was designed to keep the head elevated while sleeping. Headrests made of marble, ivory, ceramics, wood, and even glass were also found in Egyptian tombs from 3000 BC until 30 BC, indicating that it was a long-standing practice. And what was the idea behind the use of stone? Wait. Did I just hear that right? Did I just hear that right? Glass. Glass. Now, where, who made glass? How do they make glass? I really want to know what type of 
sorcery they had going on because it's like pottery. Okay, I understand that. But glass? <sighs> Come on, somebody. This headrest, which consists of a flat base and a concave section on its upper side, is believed to allow air currents to flow and cool the sleeper in hot climates. Egyptians believed that the head was the seat of spiritual life and should therefore be protected. Number two, the world's oldest parliament was built in 930. The Althing is the national parliament of Iceland and the oldest legislature in the world that still exists. Built in 930, the formation of Althing marked the beginning of Iceland as a nation. The Althing started as a meeting of the country's most powerful leaders. The purpose of their meeting was to make laws and rules on matters of justice. All free men but slaves and women could attend the assemblies, which constituted the main social event of the year. The implication of the... Look how good... Just look how good that house still looks. It's scary, man. That's scary. But why does it have 1881 written on it? Um, I don't know. This one is not making all types of sense. It's really not. 1881? And then it's saying something else. But, I mean, they might have reconstructed the doors or the windows. But they act like it's... Never been messed with. Look at the sidewalk. Is time travel? Time travel? I don't know. Discrimination was that the parliament was not completely egalitarian. The speaker of the assembly would sit on a rock at the center known as the Logberg or Law Rock. The most important group within the assembly was the Logretta, which was made up of the nation's 36 district leaders, nine other members, and the speaker. The modern-day Republic of Iceland was established at the Althing session that was held at Thingvellir on 17th of June 1944. Apart from having the oldest parliament in the world, Iceland is also the first nation to elect a woman as head of state. The woman's name was Vigdis Finnbogadottir, and she was elected president in 1980. Number one, the shortest war was between Britain and Zanzibar. The Anglo-Zanzibar War of 1896 is generally considered to be the shortest war ever. It lasted for a grand total of 38 minutes. <laughs> After the signing of the Heligoland Zanzibar Treaty between Britain and Germany in 1890, Zanzibar was ceded to British influence, whilst Germany had total control over mainland Tanzania. Britain then declared Zanzibar a protectorate of the British Empire and made an attempt to install their own puppet sultan as the head of the region. In the process, Hamad bin Tuwaini. So, so, look at him. Look at him. That's all I'm going to say. So, what he look like to y'all? What he look like to y'all? Hmm? We look like. Who had been a supporter of the British was selected in 1893. However, after ruling for three years, Hamad died oh, under cloudy chance. circumstances. Immediately, his cousin Khalid took over the palace with his armed men after ignoring Basil Cave's call that he should stand down. Immediately? Immediately. Yeah, I think he got. Do y'all think Khaled got him out the way? Who he look like? Y'all ever heard of DJ Khaled? This is, I don't, man, look, look, man. DJ Khaled, don't come after me, man. I love your wings. I love your music. But it's just a coincidence. It's just, it's just a coincidence, man. I mean, look at it. Look at it. Will somebody just, will somebody look at this, please? Somebody please come look at this. Cave was the chief diplomat in the area. By 9 a.m., the British ships were ordered to bombard the palace, and two minutes later, the majority of Khalid's artillery and men had been destroyed. 
Khalid succeeded in escaping and left his servants and fighters to defend themselves and the palace. By 0940 AM, the war had ended and Sultan's flag was pulled down. In essence, the war practically took just 38 minutes. What do you think about these historical facts? Yeah, Show your man. views in the comments. Let's talk. Yeah. Even if you stop Share that in the comments, please. Please share that in the comments, man. I want y'all to studied history in school. There is a great know. chance that you didn't learn about these intriguing history. Please, y'all. Uh, share. Like this video is from Top Discovery. And hey, it's official. Man, it's official. Y'all hit that like button. Hope y'all learned something. Hope y'all learned something, man. Subscribe. We're gonna be doing a whole bunch of these, a whole lot more. This was this was intriguing. It's about I say fifteen things that I did not know. So let me know how many things you guys knew and what you guys didn't know. All right, all right, I'm out.